Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 51. Today my guest is artist Sarah Byfield. From the very first interactions I had with Sarah, I knew that she was a highly sensitive person, someone with an open heart. Sarah cares. She cares about nature, about people, about culture and about family. If you know Sarah's work already, you will know that she's motivated by wanting the world to be better, safer, more equitable for everyone to have access to green space and places where they can put a seed in the ground and watch it grow. If you don't yet know Sarah, then I'm looking forward to sharing this moving conversation with you. Let's listen. Thank you so much for being here with me. I feel excited because I feel like we've connected in one way already and I also feel like there's so much for me to learn about you and so much of your story and your what you share on your Instagram page resonates really deeply. And at the same time, I feel like I'm going to be learning about you along with the listeners. So I'm really excited about this. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I feel really excited to be here. It's really lovely. Your Instagram page is this magical mix of words and imagery and drawings and history and folklore. I love the things you write and you bring in memory and family stories. And I really got lost in your Instagram page in the absolute best possible way when I was researching this. And yeah, Aww. you really have something to say and I'm really glad you're here. Oh, that's so <laughs> lovely to hear. Thank you, Beth. And that, yeah, that means a lot to me. So you are in Wales and you grew up in a really remote part of Wales and I'd love to hear all about that, about growing up in this part of the world. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Wales, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Wales, I love it here. Um, so I grew up, uh, yeah, in quite a remote part, although, yeah, I realised compared to Australia, Wales is so small, so um, remote for us is probably <laughs> yeah. not really that remote um, for Australia because, <laughs> it, yeah, it's so expansive. Um, but yeah, definitely for Wales, um, kind of, I grew up on a little, uh, small holding, um, up, uh, kind of on a peat marshland. My parents, so they, um, they were actually just like coming through the area on holiday and they'd been living in London for quite a while and they were a, a military family. They're all like service people. Apart from me, I'm like the odd person out, um, <laughs> So yeah, they were coming through and they saw a field for sale and they were like, oh, let's do it. Let's get a field. And um, my dad built a little bungalow and yeah, they've never left. So yeah, they didn't think they could have children at first, um, but then they had me. So I had this really magical childhood just uh, growing up with lots of animals and lots of wildlife. And yeah, really, really, really privileged. Um, I had a lovely time. Wow. So are your parents from Wales originally? Did you grow up speaking Welsh? Was that your first language? Uh, yeah, sort of. So my parents aren't um, from Wales. My mum's Scottish and my dad's from Yorkshire. But um, in kind of rural, small okay. communities, uh, Welsh is very much the first language. Um, so you don't really speak English at school unless it's like an English lesson. Um, we just speak Welsh so it was really easy for me to pick it up because it, it's so much easier when you're younger to pick up languages isn't it so I was really lucky in that way that I've got Welsh as well as English yeah my name is Welsh in fact yeah I know yeah yeah we're not Welsh but my mum loved the name and so I feel connected to Wales just because oh. of that and sometimes I meet Welsh people and they pronounce it in a Welsh way and so we have, we say Bethan, but in Wales, I think you would say Bethan. Yeah, Bethan. In, in more say. of a Welsh way. Anyway, I feel, I feel, I feel connected to, um, to Wales for that reason. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, I think we're all, it's, I think, yeah, you only have to go a little ways back and you realise how connected we all are. So I think it's lovely. Names especially kind of can carry those sort of stories, can't they? 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So you told me that back when you were a child, you found um, school a bit of a challenge and connecting with children a bit of a challenge and that drawing was your way of being comfortable in the world. Yeah, definitely. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm really dyslexic. I really um, struggle to learn to read and write, uh, especially compared to the other children. Um, and my school was pretty small, so there was only six people in my class. Um, and I don't think I realised until I was an adult how, um, I guess, sort of withdrawn I was because I was just in my own world a lot of the time I think and I really connected to the kind of animals on our small holding and I could tell you so many stories about Albert the pig but I probably didn't know that much about the other children in my <laughs> class which sounds so mean um it sounds so mean um yeah I, I definitely didn't mean it in that way I just yeah I think that I think yeah animals and plants just kind of made more sense to me and yeah, when the other children in my mm. class realised I could draw, that was very much a, a way for me to make friends. They'd say, oh, draw me the dog on my pencil case or something. And then I would have to draw like six dogs on pencil cases and hand them out to everyone. <laughs> and that was kind of my um, social currency, I guess, um, for getting to know people yes. and, and feeling like valued as part of the group. So, yeah, that's I guess that's kind of stuck with mm. me. That's so interesting. And then you grew up and you went on to study art at university. And was that a natural progression? Did you always know that that was what your path would be? Um, yeah, sort of. I think when I was little um, and we'd visit family and I'd kind of be drawing, they'd say like, oh, she's going to be an artist, she is. And I'd think, oh, yeah, I'd love to be an artist. But it, I guess I think a lot of people go through a phase at school where they think, oh, is that really a job I can do? I don't know. Maybe I should do something proper, whatever that means. Um, and so, yeah, for a long time, I yeah, for a long time, I really wanted to be a vet um, and just spend loads of time with animals. But it, I sort of realised that I'd have to move away um, to study to be a vet, and uh, just being close to my family and being at my in my place in this landscape and. Um, was just really really important mm. to me and I I really didn't like the idea of moving away and I thought oh, if you're an artist you can live anywhere you want and you can be with your family and you can um, give as much time and love to people that you need to your, your job isn't all consuming I was probably a bit wrong about that but that's what I, <laughs> that's what I thought at the time I thought <laughs> yeah I can I can um <laughs> stay I can stay near home and because it doesn't matter where you live if you're an artist uh, so I, yeah so that's why I decided yes. to go to art school and was nature always a theme coming up in your art during your studies or did you come to that later yeah definitely um yeah I, I was really I was always drawing leaves and flowers and landscapes and I'm not sure it really <laughs> that really went down very well at art school I think um yeah at the at the time um yeah, those things weren't really very fashionable and I think art school was yeah trying to make more comments on the human bubble rather than the natural world and it was all kind of like shock tactics and stuff and I just wanted to be like but look at this leaf guys this leaf is amazing <laughs> 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 um, yeah so yeah I'm not sure that that really yeah went down so well but I, I really enjoyed it I, I specialized in in printmaking and that was really lovely because it's it's more of a kind of communal atmosphere because you have to share equipment and mm. um, share material shares inks and rollers and stuff so you can kind of look and see what other people are doing and be like oh my gosh that's so cool how do you do that and you get this really lovely like exchange of ideas going on and it's just a really nice environment I really I think yeah if you can get a class where a classroom like working really well it's just like the best place I just love it um I just love that sense of learning from each other as well as from a teacher it's really yeah it's just really exciting I love that 
I've always, always been drawn to prints. Oh, Whenever cool. I'm looking at art in a gallery, it's always the prints that I'm attracted to. And I've reflected on like, why? Why is this so attractive to me above other things? But it's always been that way. And I don't know if I can articulate why, but I just, I just love it. I love them. What was your area? What did you, what type of printmaking did you love to do? Um, yeah, so I, I guess I, I sort of specialised in lithography, um, stone lithography. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, working with the stone, I just, I don't know, I think originally I started doing it because it was just really hard and I just couldn't get the hang of it. So I was like, oh, I've got to do it again. <laughs> I've got to do it again. Because <laughs> I just kept doing it wrong. Um yeah, it's quite tricky, but um, yeah, I just there's just something really magical about using the stones and you'd get these stones, you have to sort of like grain the surface, remove a tiny thin layer of surface so you've got a fresh surface to work on. And sometimes you get like these ghost images of things from artists that have used the stone before mm. you come up. I remember once I had like a map of York come up as I was polishing the stone. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Wow. And, um, yeah, they, so they've got this kind of memory and history of their own that you're interacting with as the artist, which oh. is really lovely. And because they're, they're, it's limestone, so they're sedimentary, sometimes you get fossils and things come up in the surface and you think, oh, this this rock, wow. you know, this, this was alive, this had living things within it. And it just kind of married perfectly with wanting to make landscapes and um, make landscapes that were about ecology and things interacting with each other and history because the the stone itself was kind of doing that already so uh, yeah it just it just blew my mind I loved working with the stones <laughs> oh my goodness that sounds amazing oh to find a fossil in your stone is amazing I know yeah it was so yeah some stones are really yeah they're just oh I just can't describe what it's like working on them the surface to draw on is really really beautiful as well and you um to yeah. use a range of different it works kind of just with the repelling of grease and water so if you think about like your salad dressing and the oil like floating to the top or like uh sometimes when you see like uh, fuel like petrol or something like floating on the top of the puddle it's like the exact same thing that's happening in lithography so okay. you draw um with greasy materials so like greasy crayons or greasy inks and then you use water to keep um, some areas of the stone clean and you use uh, nitric acid to kind of fix the greasy materials into the surface of the stone. Okay. So uh, the process is called soapification. So you're actually making like a kind of soap inside the stone. Wow. Um, and the stronger, the more grease and the more acid, the kind of stronger that concentration of soap and the more ink that place will hold so the darker that bit of your image will be so there's this lovely like synergy between thinking about kind of making marks but also like letting the process um like working with the process to create the image as well um which i think mm -hmm. I don't know it can be really tricky but i think if you're quite an anxious person like me it's really lovely because it you kind of have everything broken down into steps for you you're like right step one I'm gonna get this stone and I'm gonna just make the surface gorgeous step two I'm gonna use this material mm. step three I'm gonna etch it and it, it kind of like breaks it down for you and it makes the image much more manageable and yeah, that's why I have so much respect for people that paint because I'm just like, oh, you just go from blank piece of paper to painting. It's just, oh, I don't know how you do it. It's amazing. <laughs> the options are too wide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. I feel like you have this amazing eye for noticing details and noticing, uh, what am I trying to say? So I was looking at your your photos and reading your stories and your photos make me feel like I'm in the landscape with you. You you pick out details that evoke something inside me, a feeling oh. or a desire to understand more and I feel like I'm there. And then when I read what you've written, ah, oh, you just evoke something really strong and powerful. I feel like you have a creative eye that runs 
not just through artwork but into photography and writing definitely and you you mentioned that you are dyslexic and that you've I read somewhere that you wrote uh, that you've always tried to write as much as needed but as little as possible yeah, and that absolutely. made me smile but then I was reading I was reading your captions and you have an amazing way with words amazing and I was reading them thinking Sarah has to write a book your your way of expressing yourself with words is incredibly poetic and oh. I just wanted to tell you that because you know we can carry sometimes carry things like this label of dyslexia but you you have a magical way with words and that that transcends whatever label you you have <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Beth. And I feel really, oh, I feel really moved hearing you say that because it's, yeah, it's been a real, it's been something that I've just been trying to do recently to kind of write more. Um, I still feel really clumsy about it. I still, yeah, I feel like, oh, I can't write things. Um, <laughs> I'm dyslexic. I can't write things. I don't write. Um, but I've been really enjoying it. And I think especially um, this past year with everything that's gone on it's been really lovely to just have a, a little tiny place to kind of express myself and and write things down so I yeah I really appreciate you just taking the yeah. time to read it let alone saying all these lovely encouraging things to me thank you so much it's, it means a lot <laughs> But I don't say them just to be encouraging. I say them because that's how I truly experience it. When I was reading them, I really felt moved. I really felt a lot of feelings inside me as well as just the interesting facts. But your your way with words is really beautiful. Oh, thank you. I'm definitely really enjoying um, the freedom that writing uh, brings because it's I don't know it's you can say a lot more than you can with just one piece of paper and a drawing well I don't know some people can say like everything with a drawing can't they but I yeah I, I, I can't <laughs> so yeah it's really nice to have that accompaniment of being able to write words as well yeah yeah and I think that's the power of nature journaling because when we're nature journaling we're thinking in terms of yeah words pictures and numbers ways to bring it all together and what what can I express with words that I can't express with a picture and what can I yeah how can I express it in the best way with the tools that I have and that's a beautiful thing we don't need to capture everything with one language but um, each one has its own beauty and its own way to communicate certain things oh yeah definitely that's a really that's something that I found really freeing as well I think um, I don't know whether this is, yeah, maybe it's just me, but I, I think um, definitely at school and generally in society, it's really easy to kind of get categorised as a certain kind of person, like, oh, you're a creative or, oh, you're good at maths or whatever yes. it is. And actually, we're all multifaceted people and we're all amazing and and we shouldn't feel like we can't yes. do certain things like, oh, but that's not my area. I shouldn't do that. Um, we should, yeah just yes. be able to go for it yeah I love that <laughs> I'd love to talk about words and language because I noticed that you like to use regional names for plants and I I think this is wonderful and it ties in with all the things that you're talking about about folklore and stories and history and culture and I'd love for you to talk about that about regional names in we don't how we don't have to get hung up on scientific names how regional names have their own value oh yeah definitely I really really believe that I love I love regional names I, I've I've really loved this past year I've been trying to learn uh, more of the Welsh names for plants um, so I think back in the 70s the Welsh National Dictionary actually um, just decided to have just one name for each plant so that um, Wales could you know you could translate things much easier which is really cool and means that you can, um, you know, translate uh, in like really important documents or like new scientific papers and things like that. But there's something really special about regional names and the stories and the sometimes songs. And I think all of those things mm. are like ways to connect. And I think anything that is helping people connect 
um, with like the wider living world has got to be a good thing. Um, I think as well, I feel a little bit a little bit uneasy about scientific names. Like they're obviously like so useful to understand um, like different groupings and oh yeah maybe this because it's got a similar name to this that might have a similar characteristic or maybe it's you know related in some way or it likes to live in the same place like you can learn so much but as well I think with the scientific names it can be a little bit of a barrier for people like um, just like mm. making relationship and making connection to plants and animals like sometimes it's just easier to remember a story like we're we're story making creatures aren't we people we love story um and that's how we relate to the world is making stories um yeah and i think it's really important to um remember and recognize um like indigenous names i think there is this history with the scientific names where just a, a group of very educated privileged people kind of decided to put things in order and uh, maybe ignored the regional names of the people that were living with and using for medicine and food and had been living with for hundreds of years those plants and animals and, and that can then get forgotten um, which I think is just a huge huge loss to everybody um, so yeah I think definitely a massive fan of regional names I think the more names yeah. it's it's like the first thing you do isn't it when you meet somebody is say your name and introduce yourself it's the first step to yes. getting to know something and um yeah I think the more we get to know the better I totally agree and I love that and I've come across people a lot of people who say learning the name of the plant helps them connect and make that connection and and that analogy of like meeting someone and knowing their name is really important and significant and but for some the latin name can be intimidating and i love this idea that a regional name or a common name can help introduce you to the plant help you make that bridge that gap but uh in a way that's that's not intimidating <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I love that using the regional names is honouring the history and making sure that that historical connection doesn't die. And I think we have to use all these things. Language, the Welsh language needs to be used to stay alive. Any language needs to be used to stay alive. And so this is part of doing that honouring and keeping the health of, of that history alive. Yeah, definitely. I don't know if you've heard of um, The Lost Words, um, Robert McFarlane and uh, Jackie Morris. Yeah. Yes, I was going to ask you about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's a project that I, I really love because, um, yeah, so oh, I can't remember the year. I think it was like 2008 or something. The Oxford English Dictionary removed lots of words from um, its junior edition that were like words for describing nature. So like acorn, otter, um, kingfisher, like all these beautiful words for oh, the names of shame. gorgeous things. Yeah. And I think there was a lot of anger at the, the Oxford um, English Dictionary for a while, but really they... They have to survey extensively and see, you know, what words are really in use. And then that's what they publish. So they had replaced them with things like block graph <laughs> and blog and things like oh, that. And <laughs> which, oh. yeah, sound a bit sad compared to Kingfisher. But I guess I do understand yes. they're, they're more <laughs> in use. But um, so anyway, so long story short, Robert McFarlane, who's a really wonderful writer, and Jackie Morris, who's a wonderful artist, they decided to um, make some poems ab about um, these words to kind of just get them out there, get them out in circulation, because if they're being used and they're being spoken and they're being written and they're being sung, then the dictionary will have to include them. And yeah, I'm really aware of how just how fortunate I was to have and still have like living in a rural place it's like so much green and so much wildlife around me and not everybody has access to that and especially like growing up as a child that, that was so important to me um 
and it yeah it just makes me incredibly sad to think that that yeah ch there are children that don't have access to that or, and people adult we need that too as, as grown-ups don't we yes I love that you're really committed to access to green spaces and you have a, a post about that about just reflecting on how can we how can we make steps towards helping people have access to green spaces. I think that's really valuable and growing spaces as well, places that you can put a seed in the ground because there's something amazing and important about being able to put a seed in the ground and watch what happens and to harvest something and to put it from, take it from the garden and put it on your plate. There's something magical about these things and I love your commitment to making this, making this accessible Oh yeah, thank you. I think it's I think it's really important. I'm really yeah, I'm just really passionate about food. I think um I don't know if we can just thinking about language again for a minute. I think sometimes the English language can be a little bit limiting if you think about the word nature and it means kind of if you look up the definition it means like everything other than people and everything other than like man-made mm. things. But like we are nature we all need to eat food we're all breathing air like we are part of this ecosystem whether we're necessarily really aware of it all the time or not like we are and yeah I, I, I just think growing food for me is just it's just really important to actually be able to eat something that has come from the sun and the earth and it's here and I know that nobody's been hurt in the making of it you know nobody's had bad yes. working conditions or um, been exposed to pesticides or the just that it's that it's a a safe and ecological process that's it's just good it's just good for me good for my family good for the whole environment yeah this idea that we are separate from nature I think is like the root of the problem in that yeah. I, I was talking to my son one day and I said something about us being part of nature and he laughed and he's four years old and he said we're not part of nature and I said yes we are look you know we're animals he said no we're not and I said we are animals and you know that idea that we have removed ourselves so far that we don't even consider ourselves part of nature is is where we went wrong I think but we we've forgotten that we are actually part of nature yeah I I totally 100% agree with you I think yeah we all spend so long I know I do um thinking about oh I need to reconnect with nature I need to get back to nature and instead of just thinking oh well I am nature um like how empowering yes. how amazing to be part of nature um, it's just, yeah, I don't, I think it is, I think it is like a root problem for lots of things. I, I know when I feel, when I take time to feel more connected, I, I like myself a lot better. I think I'm just like a yes. more empathic and just better person because I've had this time and I want to, I want to be that. I want to be able to give that to other people and it's it's just really important I think it it just helps with all areas of life to really feel your place um, in the wider world rather than it just always be this human bubble and all these things that um, just don't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Yes and you told me that you ha have felt that art and nature and connecting with nature through art the process of making art has helped you through difficult times like heavy times in life and I wonder if you feel like talking a little bit about that yeah sure um yeah I think it it you know it a hundred percent has um so I my family has had a they've had a lot of illness in my family um a lot of kind of physical suffering um and i have struggled with my mental health um a lot off and on throughout my life um and yeah i'm not sure those are things that ever really 100 percent get fixed um and it's about 
I yes. think for me it's about um, understanding like how to support yourself and I know that connecting with nature uh, especially doing that through journaling and making art is a really big part of supporting myself and of just um, yeah feeling kind of nurtured um, and getting some perspective mm. um, when everything is feeling out of control or overwhelming and you know sometimes you just um, need to just go and sit in the grass and just watch and see what stuff is going on what little beetles are doing going about their day or ants busy farming or birds busy teaching their babies how to find seeds or all of that stuff is just it's so good and I think we are I don't know I don't like to say we are meant to be because that's up to in the individual I guess isn't it but um I certainly function a lot better when I'm better connected there's definitely a physiological change that happens when you're in nature and that change that happens inside the body even without you thinking about it is is an indicator that that's where the body is designed to be <laughs> yeah oh yeah there's there are more and more studies aren't there coming out that su suggest that um hormones and chemicals get released when you're connecting and I know that I read something recently about um, kind of microbes and mycelium um, in soil when you're gardening having this like amazing effect on your brain and being almost like a natural antidepressant mm. and giving you this lift and I think yeah you know we were we were out there growing food for much longer than we've been buying it in the supermarket and what are we depriving ourselves of by not um, maintaining these traditions or maybe traditions is not really the right word because um, that kind of I don't know makes it sound archaic but it's not it's really relevant and really important to people now I think totally more than ever now because you know you it there's been this incredible surge in people connecting with nature and nature journaling and the how the whole thing about everyone's collecting houseplants now I think now more than ever when things uh, feel like they're falling apart this is when we need it more than anything oh yeah definitely and you yeah and um, yeah thank you I'm gonna say thank you as well for everything you're doing because you're facilitating that so beautifully as well with everything that you do the podcast and with nature journaling thank week you. and yeah I'm sure you're helping huge amounts of people by doing all that hard work so thank you for doing that that's really yeah oh, it's thank really great you. that's so kind <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts on what happens when you get to know a plant through the process of drawing because I know you've written about how uh, the process of drawing helps you understand and connect with a plant and I'd love to hear about that process for you what you're feeling and thinking sure well I think for me when you sit down to draw something, well, I mean, I'm sure you and, and your listeners will already know this, but when you have to draw something, it's it's kind of like a real active kind of looking. It's because you're looking and making a record of your eyes, what your eyes are looking at and the observations at the same time. And it, I think it just gives, um, it gives, it's much more like intimate experience um it I think it creates like a yeah like a sense of intimacy and relationship between you and the plant mm. or the animal or the tiny seed or whatever it is um mm. as well I think because I tend to um draw quite slowly um and sometimes I think oh that could be like quite detrimental because maybe I'm not like getting things down as quickly as possible but I find it quite a meditative process and I really love almost like um, like being lavish with my time with the plant because I just feel like oh they're getting so overlooked and I'm not appreciating them enough people aren't mm. appreciating them the way we used to maybe and I just love 
like really yeah just lavishing time and attention on them and really being like right I'm gonna get to know you I'm gonna really watch and see what's going on with you um and yeah I don't know I feel like there's a really I feel like there's a real exchange in that as well because not only am I kind of learning and um kind of wondering about like oh why is that like that and why is it this stripe is that to do with pollinators coming in on the petal or not only is that there's that sort of thing there's also I just feel like it's incredibly replenishing um and yeah and it's almost like quite a prayerful experience um just getting to yes. sit and yes absolutely yeah um it's really hard yeah sorry it's really hard for me to describe I'm not sure I'm articulate enough to describe what goes on but no these are heart things and heart yeah. things are hard to describe yeah. but it brings up for me in my mind um I don't know if you've heard this but John Muir Laws describes he he defines love as paying oh. sustained compassionate attention and that's exactly what you've just described and what you give to a plant is sustained compassionate attention and he he says that when we do this we deepen our love you know if you if you pay sustained compassionate attention to a child or a lover or you know your mom or you're deepening that relationship and you're sharing love and you can do that with a plant and you can do that with an animal or a cloud and what you've just described to me is is exactly that sustained compassionate attention Aww. with with your yeah. subject of your art yeah that's yeah that's yeah I have heard that that <laughs> does yeah that um that describes it like really perfectly yeah tell me about the 100 days project that you've set for yourself I love I love what you're doing I'd love for you to describe it to the listeners oh cool yeah well even though I, I have been to art school and stuff I stopped making art for a long time um and I went to work um, in like a residential home for a while and I worked uh, in for a mental health charity for quite a while and I mean I ended up teaching art classes there but um, but kind of yeah I don't know I, I felt like art for a long time I felt like art wasn't enough I was like oh no I need to do more I need to do more um, and I yeah I don't know and I think I think really that was more to do with me not like feeling that my art was worthy rather than it not really contributing because I think when it comes to other people's artwork I think wow yeah what a contribution um amazing so I I wanted to um I wanted to try and get back to making art but I had lots and lots of hang-ups about oh it's not going to be good enough uh, I've done all this time at art school it's supposed mm. to be good by now and it's not um you know there's just no point it's going to be terrible so I was like oh I'll do this 100 day project because I'm just going to do one tiny thing every day and it's just going to be one piece of paper and it's going to be one color and it's just going to be the one brush I'm not gonna even have to think about what brush or pencil I'm not going to make any of those choices it's just, I'm just going to keep it really simple but I am going to sit down and I'm going to do this one thing even if it's just like a tiny cup off an acorn and that's it and I'm, I'm gonna try and do it um <laughs> yeah and it, it's it's been really really good um because I can't help but um get really fascinated by whatever you see you go for a walk and it's almost like something like jumping out at you to be like oh draw me draw me um <laughs> put me in um yes you just see something and you think oh <laughs> the curve of that fern or that tiny little seed pod and you think oh, I've never noticed that before why have I never noticed that before that's so bizarre I've walked past here so many times um so it's just a really lovely experience and it really helped me um get back into some sort of pattern of yes. of, of just making marks on paper and and trying not to worry about it too much although it is like it is still a worry I think I'm always gonna worry about oh it's not good enough but um not doing it at all is not making me feel any better about it <laughs> so um yeah. whereas I do feel better when I have done it so just try and remember that and just yes. try and do it 
I feel like you and I have similar personalities in that we are capable of much too much thinking and worry and self reflect self criticism yeah. um but and i like like you say that certain things are not something that you can cure or get yeah. over um but you just have to learn to make a good life along with overthinking yeah. and <laughs> yeah, um all these all these traits that people can carry around yeah yeah <laughs> I wonder if you could tell me about nature around you. So I love to hear about um, what people see. And I know that you are embarking on a wonderful new project, which is to start growing flowers. And I'd love to hear all about this. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so at the moment I live, I live not too far from um, the small holding I grew up on, although so both my parents are disabled now, so it's not really a working small holding anymore. It's just kind of been sleeping for a, quite a while. Um, so I live not too far from them <laughs> in a little village um, in like a little old um, stone terrace house. Um, and when I go outside, um, there's lots of small farms, um, fields, lots of big chunky old hedgerows with lots of different species in them I'm a really big fan of hedgerows I know not everywhere's got them does does Australia have many hedgerows no would you be able to describe I know what one is because I spent uh, a lot of time in England and lived in North Yorkshire for a while Um, but I'd love for you to describe it for people who don't know what a hedgerow is sure so um so a hedgerow is just um well they they come in kind of different styles um depending on uh, the kind of terrain um so I think in Yorkshire do they have like a lot of like dry stone walls with like little hedges on top or something like that yeah yeah um so here it's something quite similar so there'd be kind of stones piled up on top of one another to make a boundary um to kind of keep livestock in separate areas and then um they'll plant typically like thorn bushes like hawthorn blackthorn uh in the top and slowly over time it kind of gets turns into this sort of life force ecosystem of its own it gets covered in moss and then wildflower seeds land in the moss and then they start to colonize the 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 stony banks and then the hawthorn and blackthorn they kind of make really great protective spiky places for birds to nest and then they drop seeds and then maybe there's some like wild roses start going through um and other trees because the, there's like little soil deposits getting built up um, amongst all the growth of the leaves dropping. So maybe there's like ash and oak and then ivy and honeysuckle and they all kind of tangle through each other and make this really amazing, dense, really, really highly biodiverse place, like almost like a safe place, like a corridor going from one place yes, to the corridor. other. Yes, a corridor. That's a good way to describe it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they and they get used a lot by wildlife kind of that have to travel across agricultural fields maybe they have to get from one little tiny woodland to another so they would like go along the hedgerow as like a safe place um, to get from one place to the other but a lot of them got removed um, when kind of small farms get taken over by larger farms and they because they get in the way of big heavy machinery um it's easier for them to kind of disappear Mm. but um i'm really lucky where i live there's a it's quite traditionally managed so there's lots and lots of hedgerows and lots of small fields Mm -hmm. with different things going on so um in that way i think we've got quite a lot of wildlife because there's lots of different kinds of habitat yeah that's beautiful and so the hedgerow becomes a source of a source of subjects for your nature journal as well yeah definitely I love the the hedgerows um it's something so all the lanes on all the footpaths and stuff are lined with hedgerows so um as I'm I've got a an uh my dog Carlos he's like an old retired sheepdog um so we go on lots of walks together um he's my 
he's my little best friend um I don't go anywhere without him so um yeah he comes on lots (laughs) of walks with me and it's yeah it's it's just so full it's just yeah it's so rich and so just seductive like you start looking at one thing and then you realize there's something totally different happening like in the centimeter next to it it's it's just so rich Um, and you can just spend hours and hours just on this one tiny patch and yeah poor Carlos gets fed up of me because I like stop loads on walks and he's just like (laughs) looking at me like oh she stopped again um (laughs) But yeah, he he's, it, he's <laughs> yeah, he's quite he's quite old now, bless him. So he's more yeah, he's more tolerant of me stopping all the time to look at things. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Oh wow, I love hearing about that. I love it. Um, I think we got distracted. You were going to tell me about your project to um make ethical flowers. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So this is something I. I guess I never really thought about it until um, this last year with the lockdown and stuff because it seemed a little bit like, I don't know, it seems a little bit too good to be true somehow. Um, But so because my parents Mm -hmm. have this um, small holding that's not not really in use anymore. Um, So they have um, some land, um, some barns and stuff and the irrigation and everything is already in place. Um, and there's some huge great big ponds um, and there's all this space which is is just sitting there and I think oh it's you know we're so privileged to have this space and to be kind of custodians of this Mm. space I really want to make use of it and when we first um, moved out of town to this little village we got a garden a first proper garden after living in flats for a really long time and I was like, oh, I'm going to grow loads of food, like my mum, because my mum's like amazing at growing food. She grew like so many, she grew all our, well, almost all of our food growing up, loads of veggies. I was like, oh, I'm going to grow all our food like my mum, wow. I'm going to grow loads of vegetables, we need to make use of this. Um, but then when the pandemic hit and my nan was in a, um, a care home, a nursing home, and obviously it was locked down to keep it safe. Um, to stop any germs getting in Um, so we weren't allowed we're we're, we're still actually currently not allowed to see her Um, we're not allowed to like hug or talk or anything like that and as well she um, has dementia now so um, she doesn't necessarily always know who we are Um, and it's quite it's quite difficult Mm. to have that connection Um, but my nan's garden was like heaven on earth growing up she's just like such a sanctuary her garden she loves her garden she's just had the most beautiful garden she is a different kind of gardener to me she is like you know like beautiful manicured edges whereas I'm like oh no don't worry about those edges (laughs) I've left those ragged on purpose for wildlife yeah yeah um I was like oh I can if I can grow flowers if I can grow Um, something that is going to smell and is going to be like brightly coloured and she's going to be able to touch it like that's kind of maybe like as close to a hug as I can get so I'm gonna I'm gonna do that and she's gonna know like she's gonna know that's from me because we had this connection with the garden um I've got loads of photos of me when I was tiny. She bought me like my own tiny little wheelbarrow and tiny little fork and stuff. And we used to go about the garden together as helping her garden. So I was like, oh, she'll know. She'll know that's from me. So I really try hard to grow enough flowers to be able to take like a bunch a week um, up to give her. And um, yeah, and that was really good, I think. She, she definitely did know they're from me um, when we got we got to see her for a little while this summer things opened up a little bit they had to close back down again now but um, when we went to mm. see her she didn't necessarily know who I was but she looked at the bunch of flowers and she was like oh they're from Sarah aren't they and I was like yeah yeah they're from Sarah um, so she she knew oh she um, said that yeah she knew so oh. yeah I, I just felt like that's incredibly moving yeah it's um yeah it's it's been really it's been really um 
special to me to be able to do that for her and um yeah it's been really therapeutic for me as well to like have an outlet for like my love for her as well because I can you know when I'm missing her or missing anybody I can just be like right I'm just gonna go out and I'm gonna plant these seeds and I'm gonna yeah think about how much comfort that's gonna bring when they get big and gorgeous and smell amazing and soothing and yeah I just really love being able to do that it's it's been really helped it's been it's helped me as well as kind of helped the recipient because it's given me a focus for um yeah where to put that love when you can't like touch somebody and like comb their hair or give them a big kiss or whatever you know um yeah so I thought right I'm gonna we've got this field and obviously food is incredibly important you know we've all got to eat but I was like oh this this thing with the flowers this is really important too because this is um I don't know it's a different kind of love and it's a different kind of connection and it it's just really it's been really special and important to me so I was like right if I can grow loads of flowers um think of all the connections that's gonna make and all the kind of helping people express themselves that's gonna bring and yeah it's just something I really want to do and it it's something that my journaling is helping me with as well because spending the time like drawing and noticing it it's given me some um, like insights into I guess more like ecologically friendly ways to like manage things like um, I don't know I don't like the word manage it's, it sounds like you're some sort of boss and you're, you're not <laughs> definitely not a boss when it comes to nature but um <laughs> yeah like noticing that um certain plants like uh, letting there be lots of red campion um growing wild means that the black fly aren't so much on my crop because the black fly really love the red campion and the red campion doesn't seem to mind having lots of black flies really strong and really like vigorous and gorgeous and mm. it can handle that and I was like oh you know if we just let there be more red campion then there wouldn't be that issue and all these little things it's so much easier to notice when you're journaling and then there's a record of them as well so it's it's kind of like creating a resource mm -hmm. for yourself to be a better grower um in the future or well, well, that's how I try and think about it anyway oh my gosh you've moved me so much you've brought tears to my eyes oh I'm... sorry I had some tears going as well <laughs> yeah the story of your grandma and and connecting with her through nature and shared memory and how she was able to have that moment of lucidity and recognise that that must be from Sarah because that was what you shared. Oh, yeah. I don't even know what to say to that. It's so beautiful. Yeah, she's um, very special to me, my nan. And, um, yeah, I just... I don't know it's incredibly lucky she's just spent I feel like she's just spent my whole life just pouring as much love as she could into me you know oh sorry that's when I've gone now <laughs> no please don't apologize this is <laughs> this is not the first time I've cried with a podcast guest oh, okay <laughs> oh I think these these um I think these themes bring up emotion, you know? Um yeah. I think that we um we share things with each other. You know, we share human heart experiences and the themes that we're talking about nature and connection and these things that are really um deep and connective like food and growing and time outdoors together they they um they're themes that are really wrapped up in emotion i think and yeah this is not the first time i've cried on the podcast okay. <laughs> well i'm sorry just, yeah my man it's just 
Yeah. It's amazing. And I read, um, I read something you wrote about selling your grandma's house and I'm not sure if it's the same grandma, but you talked about, yeah. um, transplanting her plants and taking certain things from her garden and p putting them in the soil in your garden and, and feeling them relax and know that they're home and this is a safe place for them. And I thought that was an incredible thing to do, like take something that your grandma put into the soil and and now you're going to take care of it. Yeah, definitely. That was, yeah, it's really important to me. It's, um, I don't know, it's a really big part of who she is, I think. it's. We still haven't finished um, kind of clearing out my nan's house. Um, there's still lots of stuff inside that, yeah, we haven't kind of figured out what to do with, but my... The main sort of thing was like, oh, I just have mm. to, I just have to get her plants safe, um, because That's I just, I don't know, I just don't think she'd want them to die. I, and you don't, I mean, the next person that comes along might love that garden so much and take care of everything, um, but then they might, I don't know, want to build an extension and they might just weed kill everything, and I just, oh, I just couldn't, I couldn't drive past and see that happening. I, yes. Um, yeah. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for being here with me and opening up your heart and your story and I feel I feel so moved and I feel so lucky that um to have the chance to chat with you about that and I just want you to know you have an amazing heart. I can feel that you're just uh, a really loving person who moves through the world with the intention of making it better and I feel lucky to have met you today so thank you for being here oh thank you Bethan thank you for um yeah listening and, and wanting to know and for everything you do and it just feels lovely to be able to connect with you even though you're so far away um there are there are good people everywhere aren't they yeah Oh, thank you for sharing your story. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Sarah. Sometimes it's really hard to know what to say after a very moving conversation like this one. I think it's because we as humans are capable of so much that's beyond words. Love, connection, heart-to-heart -heart connection loss, grief, depression, transplanting your grandmother's plants into the soil after selling her house. The human experience is complex and the heart feels so much. We don't always have to have the words to describe it, but sometimes we're able to communicate these unsayable things with a look or a sigh or by sharing tears of recognition and empathy with someone. Sarah's story of planting a field of flowers so that she can give them to her grandmother in place of the hugs that can't be shared right now, it's one of the most moving things I've ever heard. It's love in action. It's nature as an expression of love. It's touching their shared past. It's a gift representing all the hours that Sarah spent in the garden with her family, with their hands in the soil together. I've been feeling really lost lately, confused by all the stuff that's happening in the world right now. It feels so out of control and people are divided and people are being angry at each other and families and friendships are falling apart. People are under pressure and expressing this outwardly as anger. And this conversation, it moved me and reminded me that what we need now is gentleness and kindness, and it reminded me that human connection is life's most precious gift. We need to cultivate kindness the way we cultivate our gardens. We need to grow love the way Sarah is growing the flowers to give her grandmother each week. We need to deliberately sow seeds inside ourselves that are going to bloom into something beautiful. Taking care of each other in small and loving ways is going to make a world of difference.
as we navigate through this time in history. We can make this better for each other with love and care and kindness. I'm sending you my very best thoughts. Stay well. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week.